Well, uh, first I would like to thank uh, IPAM <clears throat> for the support of this workshop, and also especially for the organizer uh, for the effort to rearrange the whole event online uh, in such a short amount of time. In today's talk, I'm going to present some um, of our recent work on this uh, model-based learning approach for the design of nonlinear optimal feedback control. Uh, my name is Chigo. I'm a professor at the Department of Applied Mathematics at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, this work is a, oops. It's a joint work with uh, Professor Wei Kang at the Navy Postgraduate School and a PhD student Navi at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, most of this uh, presentation is about uh, is based on our recent paper, uh, this archival paper, and also. Uh, to appear in SAC this year. Okay. So in this talk, we're interested about this nonlinear optimal control problems. Um, so we try to design this control U <clears throat> to minimize this uh, performance metric given by this uh, endpoint cost and also this running cost, okay. and subject to the dynamic system as well as some constraint. And for this optimum control problem, it's well known that there are two types of solution, open loop and uh, closed loop solutions. And to get open loop solution, um, there are a variety of uh, very mature computational measure can be used. Uh, roughly speaking, those computational measure can be grouped into two types. One is so-called indirect measure and, so, and also direct measure. And in indirect measure, the basic idea is just to use Pontryagin minimum principle to uh, uh, to formulate this uh, necessary automatic condition, okay, which is uh, basically a, a two-point boundary value problems. Then you can use the numeric algorithm to solve those boundary value problems using, for example, a shooting method or collocation type of method to generate the open loop optimal solution. And in direct method, the basic idea is just to direct, uh, discretize this infinite dimension of uh, optimal control problem. For example, we can use Euler or Roncada or sort of special collocation measure to discretize this uh, state dynamics. And uh, <coughs> also uh, numerically compute this integration. Okay. Then this uh, optimal control problem can be converted or approximated by a finite dimension optimization problem. The solution to this opposition problem uh, provides uh, approximation to the continuous uh, to a solution of this continuous optimal control problem. Okay. Now, both of the direct measure and indirect measure have been uh, successfully applied in solving many uh, application problems. Uh, however, from practical viewpoint, those uh, open uh, open loop optimal control are not. Uh, uh, desirable, okay, uh, especially due to the lack of uh, robustness. So when you compute this open loop optimal control, let's say this U star T, and based on a given mathematic model of your dynamic system, now if you <coughs> phase this computed open loop optimal control to a physical system, then the trajectory of the physics system, which is represented in this red line here, typically will deviate from the planned optimal trajectory uh, represented by this uh, blue line. Okay. And this deviation is mainly due to the uncertainty. And there were uh, a lot of different sources for this uncertainty in optimal control problem. Uh, for example, uh, uncert this uh, uncertainty can include parameter uncertainty in your dynamic system, uh, uncertainty in the initial condition, uh, on model dynamics, or external disturbances. Okay. So from practical viewpoint, it's desirable to get uh, feedback optimal control or closed loop optimal control in order to mitigate the effect of those uncertainty. Okay. Now within the optimal control framework, to get the feedback control or closed loop control, the different approach. For example, one can use a so-called model prediction control. And in model predictive control, essential idea is to uh, generate feedback through real-time computation of uh, this open loop optimal solution. So essentially, you just update your open loop optimal control in an online and real-time fashion. Okay. Of course, you can also get uh, feedback control by solving this uh, Hamilton-Jacobi-Bierman equation. 
and which is the equation uh, with respect to this value function v. Okay. Now, if you can solve this IJB, look at the value function, then the optimal feedback control is given by this value function. Okay. Uh, basically, optimal feedback control is given by the gradient of this value function. Okay. So, by, uh, so if you, this IJB can be solved, then you can get optimal feedback control, which is very desirable from practical viewpoint. And however, to solve this IJB equation, uh, it's well known that uh, solving this IJB is very challenging, especially for high dimensional problems due to the curse of dimensionality. So it's not surprising that over the last few decades, uh, a lot of research being carried out on solving this high dimensional IJB. And this is also the focus of this workshop. Okay. Uh, here's a very incomplete list of some of the uh, existing measures. And they include, for instance, a grid based measure or causality free type measure, and more recently, machine learning type of measure. And in this talk, uh, the measure we, we, we present is uh, basically belongs to this uh, last category machine learning type of measure. More specifically, we want to use neural network to approximate the solution of IGB equations. And <clears throat> what I show here. Uh, is a, a basic structure of a so-called feedforward neural network. And in this feedforward neural network, essentially each layer, the output of each layer of this uh, neural network is input to the next layer. Okay. Now this structure basically <coughs> provide a way to uh, approximate complicated or high dimensional functions by composition of simpler functions. So each layer of this neural network is basically defined by this function g. Okay. And this function g, in, in this uh, function g, the sigma here is activation function. Okay. And the weight matrix w and the spiral vector b, they are the tuning parameters of this neural network. So essentially in this feedforward neural network, what you try to do is to tune those parameters w and b to match the uh, some given input out of relation. Okay. Now, a neural network has been well successfully applied in many machine learning type of applications. For example, in uh, image processing and also in uh, natural language processing. And in those applications, neural network has demonstrated uh, the efficiency in approximating high dimensional functions. And recently, the new network uh, also also be used to approximate solution to IJB equations. Okay. For example, um, uh, Han and uh, Vina Er they have this uh, result to utilize the uh, backward stochastic differential uh, equation with neural network to approximate solution to some uh, high dimensional. Uh, stochastic open control problems. Okay. The neural network uh, are also used in this least square type of sense uh, to solve IJB equation by minimizing the residue of the IJB equation. Okay. And motivated by those uh, recent success of using neural network for solving IJB equations, so we propose a model-based and data-driven learning measure for the computation of, or for the design of optimal feedback control. And the, uh, the idea is illustrated in this diagram. Okay. And basically in this, whole, uh, in this talk, I'm going to just explain different components of this diagram. And this, <coughs> uh, this measure is a model-based and data-driven measure. So basically use uh, this control system model okay together with some algorithm to generate data. Okay. And those data will enable this iterative learning process okay, to train the neural network. And in the end, we're, we're, we can get this optimal feedback control represented using this neural network. Okay. Now this uh, architecture for this computational optimal feedback control design is a model based. Okay. Uh, so basically for any given, uh, control problem, okay. control applications. The first thing uh, we do is we can model this control uh, problem into an optimal control setting. Okay. 
And <clears throat> so different control objectives, uh, for example, the um, uh, regulation type of problem or stabilization type of problem uh, can, all, can all be more, uh, mapped into a model into some constraint or using those cost functions. And once you model this control uh, problem in using the optimal control setting, then the optimal feedback control is given by solution to IJB, okay, which is basically the uh, value function. Okay. And solving this IJB is a computational challenge. However, there do exist quite a lot of uh, efficient numeric algorithms to generate some data that can provide very useful information about value function. For, in, for example, one can use characteristic based method or in, uh, direct type of uh, method to generate uh, open loop optimal control. And those open loop optimal control will basically provide you the information about the value function at a given point in state space. And for this our, uh, data generation algorithm, uh, Professor Wika at Naval Postgraduate School, he's going to give a talk on Thursday, okay, focus on this uh, numeric algorithms to generate data. Now, uh, once we combine this uh, mathematic model for the control system together with this uh, data generation algorithms, okay, then we, we get the freedom to generate uh, data to train the neural network. Okay. And also we can use uh, this data generation algorithm to generate independently this validation data to uh, estimate, to do error estimations. Now to illustrate this idea, okay, let's consider a characteristic based measure on a simplified open control problem. Okay. So in this simplified open control problem, uh, it has no con uh, control or pass constraint. Well, uh, for this optimal control problem, if we apply Pontryagin minimum principle, okay. we can write down the necessary conditions okay. uh, for, for the optimal solution. And the optimal solution must satisfy this boundary value, basically this boundary value problem. Okay. Well, this U star, which is optimal control, is given by uh, this Hamiltonian minimization condition. And in this necessary condition, this lambda is a cold state or a joint variable. And this boundary value problem basically provides the characteristic system to the IJB equation. Okay. And here we do assume that the, the, this boundary value problem has a unique solution, which is optimal solution. Now, if you solve this boundary value problem for any given initial condition x0, then you can generate an uh, open loop optimal control U star and the corresponding state trajectory X and also the joint variable lambda. Then based on this open loop solution, you can obtain the <coughs> value function okay, along these characteristics. Okay. Moreover, this uh, joint variable lambda basically provides you the gradient of the value function along these uh, characteristics. Okay. Now, so using this characteristic method, you can basically generate a large data set starting from different initial condition, x0. And this characteristic based measure has some practical advantages. Since it's causality free, okay, so that basically means you don't need a, a grid. Okay. And you can generate the data independently uh, at different uh, point in state space. Okay. And also the, uh, this data can be generated in a parallelized manner. Okay. And once you generate this data set okay, for different choosing initial condition x0, then based on this data set, we can try a neural network to approximate the value function. And once you get approximate uh, neural network representation of the value function, then based on this neural network representation of value function, you can uh, compute the optimal feedback control. Okay. So next, let's take a look at this uh, neural network design. Okay. Uh, the data set provided by this characteristic method uh, includes this state trajectory xt. Okay and the value function along these characteristics and this adjoint variable lambda. Okay. 
And based on this in data input data x, which is x at the time instance t, okay, then one can construct a neural network. And this neural network will produce approximation of the value function. Then we can compare this neural network approximation of the value function with the given data, which is this vi, where this super index i represents the i's uh, data point, so i sample trajectories. Okay. And this loss function, loss function, especially is the difference between the given data vi and the neural network approximation. Okay. So by tuning these neural network parameters, those weights and the bios, okay, we can try to minimize the difference between the neural network approximation of value function and the true uh, value of the data uh, of the value function. And this is a very straightforward uh, idea. And in this approach, uh, and here essentially we're doing this uh, regression. So basically, okay. and when we apply this idea to solve some uh, problems, it turns out that performance is actually not satisfactory. Okay, uh, which is actually not surprising. Okay, if you look at this structure here. Okay, in the construction of this loss function, okay, and also, of course, in the whole training process, we didn't really fully explore the information provided by the data set. In particular, okay, this adjoint variable lambda is never used in this regression type of training. Okay. So we didn't really explore the information provided by this adjoint variable. Okay. And from the open control theory, we know that this adjoint variable lambda actually provides the gradient of the value function. Now this motivate uh, re this revision of the loss function. Okay. So from this neural network approximation of value function, okay, we can use automatic differentiation to compute the gradient of the neural network approximation. Okay. Then compare this gradient with the adjoint variable from my given data set okay, to form a uh, a secondary loss function, this loss lambda. And this loss function basically compares the difference between a joint variable lambda from the given data and the gradient of the neural network approximation of the value function. Now these two terms together will form the loss function to be optimized. Okay. And this loss function L includes basically two parts. The first part is just a regression term, and the second part will basically utilize the information provided by this uh, adjoint variable lambda. And this loss function, this mu is a parameter. If you set mu equal to zero, then we do basically regression. And if mu is a non-zero uh, and positive number, we, this loss function will incorporate adjoint variable information from the adjoint variable into this neural network training process. And <coughs> when we use this neural network to build uh, approximation, the computation of this uh, gradient okay, of neural network can be done very easily through automatic differentiation. Okay. And this automatic differentiation is already in implemented in almost all standard machine learning uh, software packages. For, for example, TensorFlow or PyTorch. Okay. And also incorporate this uh, gradient information and also this uh, joint variable into the training process, improves the data efficiency in the sense that we can maximally explore all the information provided by my data set. Okay. And, and also it provides better control, optimal control. Okay. And essentially the optimal control is given by the gradient of the value function. So therefore, if I can approximate uh, a gradient of value function accurately, then my optimal uh, control will also be more accurate. And the training process is illustrated in this diagram. Okay. So for any given input data set, uh, uh, data point, okay, and this input goes through this neural network to generate this neural network approximation, VNN. Okay. Then this VNN is first compared with the given data set this way. Okay. Then the gradient of this 
VNN also compared with the given and the joint variable. Okay, and together they form this loss function to be minimized. The validation process is basically identical. Okay. The only difference is that for validation, we take an independently generated validation data set, okay. then apply the same structure okay, to compute the loss function. And the magnitude of the loss function basically provide a way to uh, quantify the approximation error. So next, we apply this idea to an optimal attitude control problem okay, of this rigid body, uh, subject to this rigid body dynamics. Okay. And in this dynamics, okay, this V includes these three Euler angles, and this omega is uh, angular velocity. Okay. It has three components, okay. omega one, two, and three. And the control is also three-dimensional. It's basically the, uh, the torque applied to this rigid body. And from this dynamics, you can see that it's uh, six-dimensional and highly nonlinear. The control objective for this attitude control problem is just to regulate the state variable to uh, the origin. So it's kind of uh, so it's basically a stabilization type of problem. And this stabilization type of problem is modeled into this optimum control problem subject to a quadratic cost function. So in this uh, cost function, <coughs> this running cost L is quadratic with respect to the magnitude of the ang Euler angle, the angular velocity, as well as the uh, magnitude of the control. Now, to once we minimize this uh, cost function subject to the given dynamics, then we expect that the, the optimum trajectory will converge basically to the origin. Okay. So that we can achieve the stabilization. And this same problem uh, was solved by Wilcox and Wilcox okay, using a sparse grid based measure. Okay. And in this measure, uh, in this result, uh, they use uh, about 44,000 uh, data points, or in other words, 44,000 trajectories. Okay. And, and those uh, sample trajectories are located on the sparse grid. Okay. And then, based on this sparse grid, uh, they were able to generate. A fairly accurate approximation of the solution at JB. And when you evaluate this uh, sparse grid solution over a uh, 1,000 validation data set, the <clears throat> mean absolute value is about 3.7 uh, times 10 to the power of negative 3 uh, above this order. And for the same problem, we use a fifth forward neural network. With three hidden layers and 64 uh, neurons each. So it's actually a fairly shallow uh, neural network, definitely not a deep neural network. And we optimize uh, with so basically tuning those uh, neural network parameters using uh, limit memory BFGS. The result is showing this uh, figure. So in this figure, the y axis is the arrow okay, evaluated over this uh, validation data. A data set, okay, which includes a set, uh, 1,000 trajectories. The x-axis is <clears throat> the number of samples that you use in the training. Okay. And this plot, the, this dash line, okay, this dash line here, okay, it <clears throat> represents the accuracy of the sparse grid solution use, using 44,000 sample points. And those dash line, dash down line here, okay, they are basic neural network approximations okay, with different number of trajectories and different parameters of this mu. Okay. Well, just to remind you, remind you that this mu, okay, this mu is basic weight of this uh, loss function with, uh, associated to this adjoint variable lambda. So when mu is zero, we're doing basic uh, regression, pure regression. When mu is non-zero, then information about uh, a joint variable is incorporated into the training. So from here, you can see that <clears throat> the pure regression, which is this blue line here, okay, doesn't really compare to <clears throat> the sparse grid measure. Okay. But once you turn on this parameter mu, okay, then, <clears throat> then the neural network approximation, the performance uh, of this neural network approximation significantly improves. 
And in, in particular, okay, if you look at the solution associated to uh, this 1,000 trajectories, 1,000 data uh, sample trajectories, you can see that for mu equal to 0.1 or mu equal to 10, okay, then the solution <coughs> with 1,000 sample points <coughs> basically match the solution of the sparse grid okay, using 44,000 data points. And that's about 40 times uh, reduction of the number of samples used in the construction of value function, okay, which is uh, very significant. Okay. And also this type of uh, reduction in the uh, data set <coughs> hinted that <coughs> this neural network approximation uh, measure could be uh, efficient for solving even higher dimensional problems. And in this uh, second plot here, uh, we illustrate <coughs> the training time. <coughs> and the y-axis is the training time measured in minutes. X-axis is the uh, uh, number of trajectories or number of sample points. Okay. So you can see that actually the whole training process is fairly efficient. Okay. <coughs> For example, with a, uh, a thousand data point, we can basically finish training in just a couple of minutes. Okay. And indeed, uh, most of the computation in this approach is in the data generation. <clears throat> so here in the data generation part, for instance, uh, with a thousand trajectory, in order to generate a thousand data, uh, sample data, data points, we basically need to solve a thousand number of boundary value problems, which could be computationally expensive. Now, uh, when we try to extend this approach to even high dimensional problems, okay, <clears throat> it's not surprising that the number of samples needed will also grow significantly. Okay. And so that, that means <clears throat> for very high dimensional problems, <clears throat> we'll need to generate a very large uh, sample, uh, large data set. Okay. Okay. So therefore it's, uh, it's very critical to improve the efficiency in the data generation part. Okay. And here, <coughs> we implement an, uh, uh, an idea to do uh, iterative learning. Okay. So we start from a small data set that generates offline, okay. then progressively generate more data during the training process. Okay. So basically, okay, at each, uh, training iteration, okay. So after we train neural neural network and estimate the, the error based on this validation data set, okay. Then we do a convergence test. If convergence is not satisfied, if the error is larger than the desired accuracy, then we're going to generate more sample data okay. and augment this new data point to the existing data set to start the next round of training process. And this iterative training process is made possible because here, this whole algorithm is model-based and data-driven. Okay. Combination of this model with causative free type of algorithm generate data basically enable a complete freedom to generate data. So in other words, we can generate as, many, uh, as much data we, uh, as we want. And we can generate data at any point that we want. And this situation is actually, here I want to emphasize that this, this situation is very different to some standard machine learning problems. So in standard machine learning problems, the data are given. Okay. So we have a, typically you have a fixed data set. Okay. And this data set can be generated by doing a lot of experiments. Okay. Then your neural network training is based on this fixed given data set. But here, because we use this uh, model okay, and we use this causality free type of algorithms, okay, so we have a freedom to generate data. Okay. And this freedom can be explored, for example, to design this iterative process. Okay. Now, of course, in order to uh, implement this iterative learning process, okay, now, at every single iteration, we need to answer at least two questions. First, how much data, new data is needed, and also how to select those data. Okay. And, <coughs> uh, 
And in this paper, in this archive paper, okay, we develop a empirical formula to predict the, the sample size, or in other words, the new data that needed to achieve the given accuracy. Okay. The base, every, at every single step uh, of this iterative training process, Okay. Based on the current given data set, we train the neural, net, neural network. Okay. Then based on the current trained neural network, we do an estimation okay, to predict how many new data points are needed. Okay. Then we generate the new data to enrich the current data set and start the next round of training. Okay. The details about this, uh, this, this formula is given in, the, in this uh, ICAR paper. Now this, uh, and once we know the, how many new data are needed uh, in the next round of training process, okay, the next question that need to be answered is, where should we locate this uh, new data? Or, or where, where should we generate this new data okay, in the state space? Okay. And here we can explore the freedom uh, of this data generation okay, to choose the new data point so that we can provide uh, richer information about the solution of IJB. Okay. Uh, for example, if we consider a value function of the shape given in this plot, okay, intuitively speaking, in those flat regions, we probably don't want to generate too much data points. Okay. But in those regions where the value function is very steep, okay, it makes sense to three more points okay, to capture this uh, fast change of the value function. And this intuition motivated uh, this adaptive sampling, sampling scheme. So in this uh, adaptive sampling scheme, at every single uh, iteration of this training process, okay, we first <coughs> randomly sam sample this initial condition, okay, or in other words, randomly sample the state space. Okay. Then we use the current trend neural network okay, <clears throat> to predict the, the, the norm of the gradient. Okay. Then we choose the new sample <clears throat> at those locations where the norm of the gradient is the largest. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> then we, at those new, sam uh, new sample points, we are going to generate the new data. And that's where we'll starts the next round of uh, training iteration. Okay. And of course, it's just one uh, example of doing this adaptive sampling. Okay. There are many different ways you can uh, you can do this uh, adaptive sampling. For instance, you can also choose a new uh, new point at a location where residue of the IGB equation is the largest. Okay. Now, one of the okay, Undesired consequence of this adaptive sampling is that it turns out that the point with largest gradient typically also makes the corresponding boundary value problem to be very hard to solve. And this boundary value problem, it's well known that those boundary value problems resulting from uh, natural condition, they're very sensitive to initial gas. And it turns out that when <clears throat> at those point well, the gradient of value function is large, then this boundary value problem are very sensitive to initial gas. Okay. Uh, for example, for that rigid body problem, okay. we, we select 1,000 difficult initial conditions, and difficult in the sense that uh, at those points, the, the norm of the gradient are relatively large. Okay. Then for this init uh, initial conditions, when we use a standard package as, uh, for BUAP, BUP solvers, only about 0.3% of the case where we can get the convergence. Or in other words, among these 10,000 difficult initial conditions, only three of them, you can get the solution okay, by a direct call to this uh, boundary value problem solver. And to mitigate this, this issue, okay. <clears throat> We implement this uh, neural network warm start. The idea is, uh, is actually pretty straightforward. Okay. So we use the current trend neural network to generate approximate optimal control. 
Then we feed this uh, optimal control to the, to the control system to generate a closed loop trajectory X, okay. as well as approximate a joint variable lambda. Okay. Then this uh, X and lambda can serve as initial guess okay, to start this boundary value problem solving. And it turns out that we, if we use this neural network won't, won't start, okay, we can significantly improve the percentage of the convergence of the BVP solver. Uh, for example, even we use a very inaccurate uh, trend neural network that basically corresponds to the case where mu equals zero. Okay. The, the, the average error is about like 37%. Okay. And even with this very inaccurate neural network, when you use this neural network to generate those initial guesses and fit into the boundary value problem solver, it turns out that among those tens, uh, among those 1,000 difficult initial conditions, 900 of them, you can get convergence. Now, if you use a more accurately trained neural network, okay, then the convergence, the percentage of convergence, uh, basically improved to 100%. Okay, so the convergence is almost guaranteed. And next, we apply this uh, iterative training process to that rigid body uh, nonlinear optimal control problem. Okay. And the result is given in this uh, plot. The y axis is again the, the error, estimation, the approximation error. And here, the x axis is the uh, number of optimization iterations. And in this plot, this dashed line. Okay represent the accuracy of the sparse grid okay. <clears throat> using uh, four, about 44,000 uh, sample trajectories. The red line here okay, is a neural network training uh, solution based on a fixed data set in, that includes 8,000 uh, samples. Okay. And <clears throat> the blue line is the result of this iterative training process. So we start the whole iterative training process from a relatively small uh, data set that include only 64 number of trajectories. Okay. And based on these 64 number of trajectories, we train the neural network. Okay. Then we uh, use the empirical formula that we develop to predict the num uh, number of samples that need it okay, for the next round of iteration. And in this particular case, okay, the formula suggests that another 64 new trajectories need to be incorporated. Okay. So in the second round of this iteration, the uh, iterative training process, okay. <coughs> we generate 64 number of new trajectories and in include them in, uh, into the existing data set okay. and start this neural network training based on this 128 uh, samples. Okay. And in the next round, you keep doing that. Okay. <coughs> you, uh, <coughs> uh, so in the third uh, round of iteration, uh, training iteration, okay, the training is based on about 1,000 trajectories. And in the fourth round, the training is based on 4,000 trajectories. And from this performance, you can see that even for 1,000 trajectories, we can achieve the same number of accuracy okay, as the sparse grid solution using 44,000 trajectories and the uh, neural network training based on 8,000 fixed uh, samples. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so that implies that okay, using this iterative training process, okay, with a thousand number of trajectories, we can actually beat accuracy of the neural network uh, solution based on 8,000 number of trajectories. So that's almost 10 times the reduction of the sample points. Okay. And this reduction is achieved because the training set here, okay, using this thousand data uh, number of trajectories, okay, this training set actually provide richer information. Okay. Then this eight thousand trajectories that just randomly selected. Okay. 
Now, once we finish this whole iterative training process, okay, so you apply this iterative training process okay, until the, the, the desired accuracy is satisfied. Okay. Then in the end, we can get optimal feedback control okay, and represent it using this neural network. And this optimal feedback control can then be applied to the closed loop system. So here we uh, test the performance of this closed loop feedback control based on neural network. <coughs> and here I want to quickly mention that the online implementation of this neural network uh, feedback control is fairly easy. Okay. And from implementation viewpoint, it's also fairly cheap. Uh, that's because <clears throat> it requires very low storage, okay, especially comparing to grid-based measure. Okay. And also, <coughs> the online evaluation of this optimal feedback control, which requires evaluation of the gradient of the value function, can be done very, in a very efficient manner through automatic differentiation. So basically for that rigid body problem, each evaluation of the control takes only about a millisecond. Okay. Now, if you use, say, a grid based measure to generate a solution okay, of HAB equation, then when you try to implement this uh, feedback control in a closed loop uh, online setting, you still need to evaluate the gradient. Okay. And that gradient evaluation of the value function can be computationally uh, expensive. In these two plots, we <clears throat> we illustrate some sample closed loop trajectories. So you can see that <clears throat> those all those sample closed loop trajectories that converge to uh, zero, okay. converge to our uh, converge to our range. Okay. And to test test the to further test the performance of this iterative training process, okay, we also apply this uh, idea to a a PD open control problem. Okay. And we take this problem from uh, Kalisa and uh, Kunish uh, result, the published in 2018. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so here we want to optimize this performance metric as subject to this PDE constraint. Okay. And the for the unconstrained dynamics, you can see the unconstrained dynamics is basically unstable. Okay. And the control objective is essentially just to stabilize this, uh, this dynamics. So here we discretize this uh, problem using a shape shape spectral uh, measure with n equal to 30 collocation points. Okay. So that resulting in this 30 dimensional nonlinear optimal control problems. So the dimension of the state space X is 30. And we implement this iterative training process to solve this 30 dimensional nonlinear optimal control problem. Okay. The iterative start, uh, process starts from 30 trajectories, okay. then gradually incre increase the number of uh, samples that needed to achieve the given accuracy. Okay. Then the whole, the, in the end, the solution is validated on uh, 50 number of trajectories. In terms of training result okay, for the 30 dimensional problem. Okay. Now, uh, in the end, we use 59 number of trajectories. Okay. But here, each trajectory actually contains quite a lot of uh, data points. Okay. <coughs> and the training accuracy, the final training accuracy is uh, around, it's basically in the order of negative four. Okay. And the whole training time is about 13 minutes. And this training time includes the time that we use to generate new sample point, new data point. Okay. Uh, when we apply this control to that PDE, okay, so you can see that control dynamics now basically is stable. Okay. So all the trajectories will eventually settle down to, uh, to zero. Uh, finally, some concluding remarks. Okay. Uh, so in this talk, we basically focus on this uh, model-based and uh, data-driven measure to learn the optimal feedback control. Okay. 
the essential idea is to integrate the control system model with the causality free type of algorithms. Now, this integration provides us a complete freedom to generate data. Then this freedom can be explored to develop this iterative neural network training process. Okay. So basically <coughs> generate more data during the whole training process. Then in the end, okay, the optimal feedback control is given by this neural network representation, okay. <coughs> which is rather easy to implement in practice. Okay. Well, the work presented here is really a preliminary work and a lot of uh, few, uh, further research needs to be carried out. Uh, here I just list uh, some of those uh, uh, future topics, research topics. Okay. For example, in the work that I presented, we consider unconstrained optimization problem. But in practice, most of uh, optimal control problem will have the constraint, either control constraint or the state constraint or uh, mixed state control constraint. Okay. Now for this constraint optimal control problems, <clears throat> it's very often that the optimal control may be non-smooth. Okay. For example, you can have bound bound, uh, bound bound control and those discontinuous, discontinuous optimal control well, in turn, makes the value function to be non-smooth. Now, in those cases, how to develop efficient data generation algorithm and how to develop the neural network training process is uh, deserve quite a lot of uh, research. Okay. Well, also uh, in our current work, we do assume that when you formulate that necessary condition, uh, we assume that the necessary condition, that boundary value problem, has a unique solution, which is the optimal solution. But in practice, there are many optimal control problems that have this multiple optimal solution. Okay. And if you have multiple optimal solution, okay, it imposes quite a lot of challenge on the data generation and data processing. Okay. And now, uh, also, it requires redesign of the neural network training. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> And also there are much of uh, research need to be carried out to analyze the effect of the structure of neural network on the training efficiency. Okay. For example, <coughs> what's the effect of different type of activation function and what's the effect of different uh, neural network structure. And here we test only faithful neural network. There are many different types of neural network structures that can be implemented or integrated into this uh, framework. And with that, I'm going to stop my presentation and thank you all for your attention and I'm ready to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Shi. Uh, so are there any questions? Yes. So. You can use the feature, raise your hand, and then I will unmute you. Okay, so Kriakos. Hey, Steve, thank you very much for your talk. So um, I have some questions. So uh, do you prove that while you do all this uh, approximation, so you perform some of the stuff offline, right? And then while you put this one, do you prove that you converge to the optimal solution and also your system is stable with this approximate version of your controller. Oh, well, uh, well actually we, we well, let me see. Uh, well, I'm just going to put out my overall structure here. Okay. Well, the, in this approach, well, I, in our current work, we actually don't have the proof, okay, mathematic proof of the convergence. Okay. And the error estimation is, uh, it's basically just based on this uh, validation data. So it's kind of like a stat st statistic way to, er to measure the error. So it's, it's really a preliminary work. Okay, so that we, so far we don't have a mathematic proof of the convergence. <laughs> I see. So we, uh, I mean, in the past, uh, along with uh, Frank Lewis, with several people, uh, with uh, Berchikas and Semias and other people, uh, we have attacked this problem on solving Hampton Jacobi Bellman, 
then, then uh, I would send you some papers. But uh, we have proved also the stability and the convergence results without requiring any offline publications. Have you uh, checked this work? Uh, well, I read some of those papers, but not uh, all. And if you can send me those references. Sure, I will, yeah. And um, so my last question will be, so in the problem that you solved, uh, you said you didn't incorporate the constraint, the inequality constraints, or you no, incorporate them? Yeah, for that example problem, yeah. Did you or not? Uh, for that example problem, there's no uh, control constraint. Okay. So basically, uh, any physical constraint on the control is, okay. Any physical constraint on the control is kind of modeled through this quadratic penalty term. I see, I see. Because I know that uh, handling constraints in such problems is a difficult situation. Yes, I completely and, agree. Yeah, and uh, um, so people, I mean, in the past, they have used also some barrier functions to mm -hmm. try to incorporate um, uh, such constraints. I know Aaron, we have used it also, probably Claire has done it as well. Um, yeah, but I was curious if you find another way to incorporate these inequality constraints. Well, uh, that's something that we are working on now. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Maurizio Falcone has a question. Uh, my, my question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, or good evening, depending on the longitude. <laughs> so, uh, my question is the following. Can you go back to your last slide? Okay. That was uh, giving a sketch of the whole procedure in order to use neural network. Okay. So, there is... Uh, so, the, one of the... Cru no. Okay, th that one. So, there is a crucial point there. Uh, because you are using uh, validation of data and then error estimation, mm -hmm. convergence test, and then once you uh, are at the end of this loop and finally you decide that everything is accurate, you are going up and you are going to apply the optimal feedback control which you obtain by this procedure. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wonder, uh, how you manage to control the two steps that are related to the error estimation and convergence test. So do you have a priori error estimate? Do you, do you know uh, how fast is going the algorithm? Because in the presentation, I didn't see uh, this kind of results. Oh, well, the, for the error estimation part, right now what we do in this preliminary work, what we do is we just, uh, Statistically evaluate this error based on an independent generated by the data. data. Okay. And, uh, and also, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, in this preliminary work, we don't have a mathematic proof of the convergence. So essentially, convergence uh, is kind of uh, done in a empirical way, meaning that at, at every single iteration, we're going to compute the error based on this validation data. And if the error is smaller than some prescribed tolerance, then I'm going to declare the convergence. Okay. But, but, but one of the good things is that using this uh, algorithm, we can generate a very accurate validation data okay. by solving this, for instance, characteristic system. Okay. If you, typically, if you use boundary value problem solver, you can control the accuracy of the, of the solution. Then, in other words, I, I, will, I will know that what's the error in my validation data comparing to the true solution. Okay. Then, by, by uh, validating the current tri neural network on this validation data set, that will give me a very good uh, sense about the accuracy of the uh, neural network solution, neural network approximation. Okay, but even if you don't have an error estimate, so from the practical point of view, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you uh, apply? I mean, you know that, for example, if you have a large training set, this will produce better results, and to, to, to which extent are you extending the samples and the training test? It's a, it's a bargain, right? Because you said that in order to make the training, you need half an hour, 
and then you are applying this to uh, in one of the examples and then you are applying this in order to compute an approximate value function so i guess that there must be a bargain between the number of uh, say uh, <clears throat> cpu time the cpu time that you spend training the network and the time that you spend computing the value function because to, to be accurate i guess that you need a large sample and yeah. then uh, if you want to get an accurate result you have to to refine over the computation of the value function so uh, I, i'm not asking for a precise estimate but in terms of practical rules what do you expect well uh, that's a great question <laughs> Yeah, in general, uh, let's say if you train your network with respect to a fixed data set, okay, then it's not hard to imagine that, well, the data, uh, if, a size, if you keep increasing the size of data, then you can do, at least intuitively speaking, you're gonna get a better uh, approximation error. Okay. But for high dimensional problem, oh, well, <clears throat> if you just generate your data in a random fashion, okay, typically you're gonna require a very large uh, number of data. In some of the results that I saw, well, sometimes people even use like generate like 10 million of trajectories in order to train your network for actually a relatively small uh, dimensional problem, like three or four dimensional problem. And that's why we propose this iterative learning process in the sense that I'm going to just generate data as, as needed. Okay? And I will try to generate data not in a complete random fashion, uh, instead, I would try to generate data that can provide me more rich information, richer information about the value function. And of course, uh, there, uh, there are always a trade-off okay, between the error, desired error tolerance, uh, or desired accuracy, and the whole training time. But based on our preliminary work, uh, for example, the work on that uh, rigid body, six-dimensional rigid body, and the work on that uh, 30-dimensional PDE control problems, and the training part is actually uh, fairly uh, efficient. Okay. For the rigid body, typically the training only takes a few minutes. Okay. So it's, it's not, uh, not too, uh, I would say it's pretty efficient <laughs> uh, okay. for, that, for that example problem. Okay, thank you. Okay.